thank you everyone for joining us for this month's hardware webcast. My name is Chris Dubuque, one of the field technical managers. I'm out of the Oregon office. I'm going to be helping out with our uh, presenter today. I would like to introduce today's presenter, Keith Weber. He's an application engineer with our manufacturing solutions um, part of the company. He's put together a really great presentation. So with that said, I'm going to step back and hand the presentation over to Keith. All right, thank you, Chris. This is uh, Keith. Today we are going to be talking about the unique finishing operations of 3D printing parts using a Roland CNC machine. So uh, let's go over the agenda. We'll first meet the team, all of the players involved in this uh, kind of undertaking. Then we're going to touch on one of my hypotheses and kind of hint at a couple of my future blog posts that are coming along. And then we'll end with why you're all really here, the uh, you know tips and tricks. So stick around to the end. We have a lot of cool pictures and great stuff to uh, you know share. Oh yeah, and then if anyone wants to poke my brain for the data that we'll touch in the uh, hypothesis area, I have that as well. So first, let's start off. We're going to be using uh, Stratus FDM, as everyone hopefully already knows. You know, FDM printing is layer by layer printing, kind of like a precision precise hot glue gun. As you can see in the animation, it layers, puts one layer down at a time. And then what we're going to be doing in our part is we're going to be cutting those layers and uh, yeah, layers in half so that we can have a smoother fit finish. There's a full lineup of uh, Stratasys machines and we'll be using the F370 and also the U print over here. But all right, while well, my animations didn't fire off. <laughs> Uh, in that, we'll be using our ASA material and in our uh, F370, and then we'll be using the ABS Plus material in our uh, U-Print. We'll also be comparing the FDM to uh, PolyJet technology. So if this one is more of an inkjet printer head that will put down layer by layer, much finer re resolution, will be down around the 32 micron layer, which is 0 .0012. Three um, inches, as opposed to the 0 0.01 inch layers on the FDM side. So for that, we'll be using our Conix 3 Object 350, and we will be running the Vero um, Magenta and the Digital ABS for our products. <laughs> so now let's meet our Roland. So Roland CNC, we have a full lineup there. We have from the small circuit bread board cutters all the way up to non-ferrous metal cutters on the right, right of the screen. So we have our MDX 540 all the way down to the MDX 40. We will be using in this uh, demonstration, well, webinar about the demonstration, the MDX 50. And then, so here's a couple little shots of our MDX 50. Note the tool and fixturing picture over here. We're going to be mimicking this and we'll also be kind of adapting it to our own uh, needs. So it has a six tool changer in the back, which we'll be using a bit uh, for the setup of our process. So note, you can cut a variety of materials. It holds a tight tolerance. We'll go over the data later. Um, the parts can snap fit together, and it's great for form function and being able to kind of test out before you go on to the final you know, part. So the software of choice for running this uh, Roland, we'll be using the SRP player, which is, as you can see here, it's a step-by-step -step wizard. We can import STLs. This way we can have STL versus STL when we use GradCab versus our CM, CM, CNN, uh, CN, CNC program. So we'll be avoiding CAM for right now. So here's the hypothesis. Adding CNC to the finishing of 3D printing, 3D printed parts will improve the tolerances and appearance of the parts. So what's our process? Well, first we'll create the generic part, unique features. Uh, we have two things that I've created. It's a standard fixture alpha VF, and then our other one, when I was dreaming of the beach, sand dollar demo. <laughs> create a table of measurements, and then we will be moving on to creation of the, or create a procedure. So the procedure, oh, of course, record the data. Otherwise, I guess you don't get paid. Uh, so we created the parts in SOLIDWORKS. 
I then create the table with all of the measurements for what the parts should be. And then I also created this column over here, which is the parts plus 0 0.02 inches on top of it. And those are the 0 0.02 is what we're going to be trying to split in half. So here's, here was my procedure. So I printed the parts off in pairs on all, of, all three of our printers, the U-Print, the S370, and the Conix 3. From there, I then split the two parts into two parts into two bins. One bin, which was breakaway sports, the other bin, which was soaking the parts into a tank. One of the, I'll say, sub ideas I had was that soaking the parts and then drying them causes the parts to change uh, shape a little bit. Then I will record the original measurements of the parts straight off the printer after the soaking, of course, for that, and when they've been dried properly. Then I will, let's call it, mount the, the jig into the mill, and note, double up on the sticky tape when uh, applying foam to the bottom. That's one of the most important things you can do. Uh, I'll go over that more in tips and tricks. And then we will I mill the ideal part, so the part without the point zero two inches out of this part. So, and then we'll remeasure measure the mill parts and see what happens. So, we printed the parts using GrabCAD. It was great. I chose sparse, low density, slice height, zero, one inch, and then we used ABS and ASA for the uh, FDMs, and then we used the Vero and Digital ABS for the polygens. Once we separated the parts, so these two bins went into our little collector here. Also, if you're using a wash tank, use the small thing for small parts, otherwise they'll get lost in the collector and you will not know where they end up. Um, then after you're done, I use a paper towel on a surface and it helps wick all the moisture out of your part. And after a sufficient amount of time, they're dry. Now we've started, you know, let's mill the, the jig. So what I took was a block of 90 pound foam, used double sticky tape to attach it to the build surface, and then we cut this little jig fixture out of it. And it looks kind of funny. It looks like a little die. I'll get into the little features of why you want these different elements in it later at the tips and tricks part. So then we place the part. This one came out of the wash tank. That's why you see the, the white dried uh, uh, material off of it. And then after it's done milling, it gets shaved down to hopefully what we wanted. And it after you kind of dust it off, it looks like this. Then we sit down and we record all of the data. It is a lot of data. <laughs> so, oh yeah, so that was the procedure. We'll dive into the data and the findings at the end because I figured that's going to be kind of the boring, the most boring part. So here go, here comes the long part of the presentation. Hopefully I didn't blitz through that first part too quickly for you. But first thing we figured out was when we are doing jigs and fixtures, we this is a test fixture, but you can see the shape. And then I really like this one because you can start seeing the striations on the side here. Um, this really shows that even though you can hold a, if you want a one inch square and you can put a one inch part in it, it gets really, really frustrating to try to fit that into your jig. So going into say, yeah, SolidWorks and actually adding in the drafts here, you can really help yourself out a bit. So let me quickly bring that over for you. Over here, when I had my uh, jig fixture, all you do is when you're making it, you go into this and this little button over here is draft on and off. All you need is a one degree or just to exaggerate so you guys can see it on the screen you'll start seeing that I can actually put this so it's wider on top so that when you're trying to line up your part, it actually drops in with ease. So the greater your draft, the faster your jigs will wear out. So you want this as close to zero as possible while still being convenient to use. One to three, I found, really helped out. Uh, once I got up to five, the jig wore out and the, it wouldn't hold as much, but three and two were kind of that sweet spot for me. So that's a little how to use your SolidWorks with the jigs and fixture. Next, you'll start noticing we have these little tabs. I call these like orientation marks. These really help out with making sure your part is facing the right way, especially when you're doing, I'll say, asymmetrical parts like I was. So 
having an orientation or remembering your orientation when you're putting it in. Then we have these two little slots here, which you can't really tell from the picture, but they actually go lower than the bed. What these are, are kind of like if you ever had to take a garbage bag out of a garbage can when it's like vacuumed in there, or when you try to shove a garbage bag in there. It just, because we're dealing with such tight tolerances with the foam and the part, it will create a suction and will fight against you. So you don't want to, you know, break your jig or be fighting with this while it's attached to a CNC machine and you're diving into the machine to try to retrieve your part. So putting these little gaps here allow you to pop it out of place a lot easier without damaging you yourself or the jig. And then 90% yeah, foam. So then here's the ones that were just on the picture. So the draft angle is right down here and it's moving up at an angle I just showed you in SolidWorks. Then it's on all sides so that it plops in just right. Then the center one is a new feature that I like. It's for centering my uh, part or my uh, CNC. So with the roll one, you have to set your center point. So using a center hole like this, this is an exact 0.25 inch hole, quarter inch hole. So I'm able to pick up the uh, probing dowel that's exactly a quarter inch and work my machine over and place it into this hole. There's, uh, let's go, I think on this one, I did put a small draft on it of two degrees so that I can slob, slide that in to get a near perfect zero zero. And that enables me to zero zero my CNC on a, uh, what's called XY. So now the jig is zero. Then note the four uh, circles in the corner, those are for prying my little parts up. My parts are actually an inch by inch, so they're actually pretty small. I did that so I could print off lots of them in rapid succession, so I could uh, you know, get as much data as possible. Granted, I'm pulling way too much data out of these things and measuring too much, so it still was a time-consuming process. So yeah, with this one, it was a one degree draft angle, easier to insert and remove uh, leverage points. Also, when a couple of the pieces actually got wedged in there and wouldn't want to release, I could take a, uh, my car keys and pop the part right out of the uh, picture just by jostling it into that little circle because those go past the bottom. And then the center hole for, you know, the, or centering the, or putting a zero at the XY. So now, why do, why did I mention double sticky tape? So this is one that I was trying to mill down and build a jig into, and it actually came loose from the bed with, uh, that was double sticky tape. Double, double sticky taped too. This, you know, can be avoided by either doubling up on the double sticky tape or wiping down your bed with a damp cloth to make sure you get all the dust and particulates off of the flat bed before you try to attach any blocks of foam. This is uh, pretty important because otherwise you'll have a block of foam flying out and scaring you while you're uh, trying to take measurements next to it. Um, then the one, all right, so double sticky the bottoms, and on the smaller jigs or fixtures, you want to make sure it's really clean so it can stick, because if you have only one piece of tape for a big block and it still comes loose, having only an even smaller piece of tape on a smaller one, you really want to make sure that's clean. And then, yeah, it just was cruising along and then caught the edge there and threw it. Next, this is part of where the wear came out. Uh, the jig with the, uh, this one was a, uh, I believe a th three or four degree. Um, I just forgot. Uh, what was it? A draft angle. There we go. Um, was a three degree draft angle. So as we were placing the jigs into this, it actually wore out pretty quickly. And then one of the pieces got picked up by the mill and thrown off of it. So it won't hold the piece. So the tighter you can make that draft angle, where it's still usable is ideal. So having a three to four degree draft angle, I could mill about three parts before it would fail on me. While having a one degree draft angle, a little bit harder to get in, but still worked, I was able to get out about eight or nine per um, jig. So that was easier. Now, one of the questions you may be asking yourself is, well, how do you zero the uh, Z? You have the fixture, now you need to, you know, zero this part that you're going to mill. So here we are. So 
this is a picture zoomed through the outside of the safety box. And you can barely see it, partly because I couldn't get the camera in the right angle, but there's like a hair clearance between the bit and the part. So one of the ways that I was able to achieve that is using post-it notes. <laughs> so you would apply the post-it note to the tallest part of your piece, and then that tallest part of the piece with this box on the outside that I purposely left should be the exact height of your part at your tallest part before you mill. So it should be flat, and then once you apply it, ha, huh, hopefully you guys can see this. So as you, I attach my phone to the outside of the case, I'm down on my knees looking across, waiting for that uh, perfect too much, too little wiggle when you can see that it starts bowing down. So once you have that kind of valley forming with your uh, point, because the point's right on top, then you know that you've locked the uh, Z axis, the Z to the right zero. And then after you power down and actually get up really close to it, you'll see that there's only like a, a hair between your tip of your bit and the top of the part. So now, what are the results I'm betting? You're wondering, why do all this? Well, here's what was before and after from my uh, colleague Colin. And was it? he shaved off seven thousandths from the outside and then or started off with one thousandths and then went all the way down to seven on the other here. So you can see that it's, you know, you have a lot of layer lines. Now it's actually a polished like ball without touching it, which is really, you know, great. I don't know if you've ever had to polish a half dome before off of a 3D printer. It's a real pain. So then here's my sand dollar example that I was able to do into four parts. First, you can see there's a lot of texturing on this top part. And then when we go in and remove the same, this one was 3 thou off of the, the right bottom sector over here, this was using a 1 8 bit, it, inch bit, a 16th and a 32nd. And then you can see the differences between the two. Now the time savings here is with using the 1 8 bit, it was about a half hour. The 16th in the top right corner is, was an hour and a half, and the 32nd was about five hours to two. And then I'm actually holding the part in front of me right now, and I can tell you between the 16th and the 8th, there isn't too much of a noticeable difference between the 8th and the 32nd. You can, there's a like a pretty pretty good difference that you can see. So. I would recommend actually sticking between like the 16th and the 8th, and then just hand polishing from there. Here's a couple of close-up shots, and you can actually see like over here, when you hold it up to the light, and it's actually on the Z-axis when you're uh, machining it, the layer lines like completely disappear, and it actually looks like almost injection molded plastic with a little bit of a of some lines of how it was yanked out of the mold. So the the flat side Z, or the top surface, the, the Z surface, or the XY surface on the top part of your part had some improvements, but as we all seen with the, just how weird the texture on the top usually is, it's hard to fix. But then the side is actually where it kind of shines in this type of process. It really goes and cleans up Quite nicely. Now here's back to the experiment I was running all over last week and this early this week. So on the left here is the finished part, and on the right is what it looked like before. And then here's a lineup of a couple of them. So I hope you can kind of see the um, you know the, the the sheer difference, and especially on these smaller parts. Not only were they fast, but they were been also a huge pain to try to post-process. So the top most part was actually really easy to try to, you know, like sandpaper. But once you get into these other three layers that are stair-stepped up, and then you have a, a second stair-step with the inner circle going the opposite direction, you start running into some extreme, like, how do I post-process this? And having post-processed weird other cylindrical parts that had unique geometries, like you're talking hours of 
first you get the main part done, then you move into the second, you know, secondary part, and then you just start you start with your main surfaces and you move down to the most detail oriented. And from there, that's where you're just eating up tons of human labor. And from here, you can see there's a little bit of striation left over here with some lines, but like these, like 90% of this part is like polished and, you know, with a nice clear coat, it'll be done. It also kind of is interesting because it brings out some of the, uh, the coloration in like the strands and how the dyes aren't like equally distributed in some of the prints where it just, yeah, you can see how it puts down the different layers and they get kind of see-through when you cut one in half. So it's kind of interesting to see that show up. Yeah, here's a little bit of better view into those uh, striations. And then these finishes were achieved using a 16th of a bit, or a 16th, 1 16th bit end mill flat, uh, or square flat end mill, 20 minutes uh, per each unit to be uh, processed. Just wanted to bring up the design innovation starting in October. Now I'm going to bring it up for some questions and then I guess I can show you guys the data or go back over the different pictures and try to you know, answer a lot of your questions because this is, I'll say the top level of what I've been able to find and wanted to know what you else you guys want to see. Perfect. Thank you, Keith. Hey, this is Chris. I got a question that came in over the chat. Mm -hmm. um, so it's from David. He mentioned that you use 90-pound foam for the jig. He's asking, can you recommend any materials, you know, quote-unquote, hard, solid plastics other than foam? I do have some other, I want to say it was like ABS and a heat. I would have to double-check. But the big problem with those, one of the reasons I really like the foam is because it, it is has some porosity to it. It fits like snugly and it holds the part. The the hard plastic on hard plastic, um, you have to hold really tight tolerancing, and then it also getting it to let go becomes kind of an issue. So I haven't experimented too much with the hard plastics. It's just been uh so much easier to use like this 90 pound foam um because it's just weak enough where it won't destroy a part or your it will break before you break a bit. And as we all know, bits are the most expensive part of most of the things you are uh, milling. So like the chunk of foam may only be like eight or nine dollars, but the bit that we're using is like a 30 or 40 dollar, you know, 16 uh, high detail end mill. So I I've been just kind of siding on the air of or the side of caution when using foams like i don't even we have some uh 210 and 310 or 210 pound foam and 310 pound foam as well but that would hold the part in so snugly that it would probably break any bit if there was any sort of uh miscalculation so can't really recommend any solid plastics but i can highly recommend if you're doing a lot of repetitive stuff yeah, you'll have to make more uh, like jigs because they do wear out and you know you toss them a bunch, but they are really cost effective and you do put a kind of a, a buffer of safety around your bit. I hope that answered danced around the question kind of. <laughs> Any other questions came up in chat? I don't see. Uh, let's see here. Here's one. How big was the half sphere machined and how long did it take? That was definitely an overnight. Um, Sphere, partly because we were doing the uh, it on the finest detail, it was a 32nd inch bit, uh, so it was probably between eight and ten hours. That was done by Colin. I would have to ask him, but yeah, yeah, the sphere was a four inch diameter uh, sphere, plus a little extra for the uh, couple thou to take off. Yeah, but we could speed that up using a ball end mill and like an eighth inch, and definitely go like. I'll, I'll say plow through it. Oh, since he asked about that one second. Here, I'll bring this up. So this is the actual like SRP player that comes with Roland that has been kind of having come from Cam, it's kind of I'll say limiting, but at the same time, it does make things a lot easier. So I'll just click through this. It's a five-step wizard that allows you to first import your model, choose your 
you know, scaling, the orientation of it. Then you get to do some of these general parameters. So I'm doing the best finish, which means it does more passes instead of uh, less passes. Um, there's a lot of flat. No curves on this one, and I'm only doing a top cut. On this one, I select my material from the drop-down menu. So these control all of your speeds and feeds. Um, and then from here, it auto-creates your kind of toolpath, and you just click it. This one's already made, so I'll go into here and finishing. So one of the ways we can speed finishing up if you're using a, uh, uh, a larger bit or even a smaller bit, you can do this roughing pass, which here you can see the kind of layer lines. It's pretty quick. It goes over and gets done, and it's usually about one-fourth the amount of time as, say, this finishing path. So this one is a sixteenth of an inch bit. But as you can see, like it crisscrosses, it goes one direction and then the 90 degree perpendicular to that as well to really finish up the uh, portfolio or the, the sides. So what we found with the just roughing versus roughing on like the sand dollar is that you don't really see a difference between the size of the bits between them and then between the sand dollar and the other part like you get a little bit more of that kind of cross hatching showing up on the uh, on the smaller part. And I think that's mostly from this uh, crisscrossing it does on the tools and or the tool paths. So I'm almost thinking that not using the finishing and just purely doing roughing that's even faster will actually improve the quality of your post product coming out. And then, yeah, it goes through and you can preview it. And it kind of shows you how it would look out of foam. So that's SRP player. It's pretty quick, easy. There's a bunch of advanced options. But yeah, so I'll bring this up again to try to show. Like you can kind of see some of the lines. Like on this one, you well, that's mostly the striations, but like some of these right over here, these white are the actual tool paths. So it's actually, as you're doing the finishing, you're leaving more tool marks in your part that you might need to buff out later. Well, if we go back over here, you can see the, like it's just, there's not as many tool marks in it. It's much smoother when you're using the roughing as opposed to the finishing. Any other questions come in, Chris? Uh, let's see here, I have a questions on uh, was the U-Print F370 or Connex 3 preferred for machining? All right, someone who asked about the data. So, here's the build spec. That's what you're waiting for, wasn't it? Uh, the, the, do you see how many numbers and things I had to calculate and it's still not all done? So, for appearance-wise, when you are milling a polyjet, that's actually one of the reasons I don't have any pictures of it up, is you can barely see that it touched the top. Like it's it's turning a glossy print with a certain uh, like layer line or print print uh, direction into a print that has a different print direction. So it they actually look pretty ideal. So I put the uh, Connex, oops, I wasn't using a Connex 2, I was using a Connex 3. Up. That one was the most ideal for carving, just because the Vera material is an acrylic base. It carves a lot easier. It doesn't have the as like stringy of the layer lines, so it's less likely to get caught on something or leave a tear. Um, but yeah, the, the Vera material uh, definitely came out on top. Then the one of the big surprises I had, which was down here, that, yes, I know this is just a mess of numbers of different percentages, and I'm apologizing for that, but the um, uh, what's called F-series managed to just sneak out on the U-print for kind of quality uh, when it comes to the base material. So how this reads is this is the, like, Slot number one is the is the part right off the machine measured. 
then this is right off the right off or the top one is number one is the 3D printer. The second one is right off the CNC. And then the C is what was cut away. And then down here we'll have the kind of the averages of the two different tests I was able to run on both sides. And then we take the the breakaway support versus the breakaway solvent or yeah the breakaway solvent and we'll see that there's there is a slight difference between the, the solvents and the or the solvent base versus the breakaway and then yeah but the f series was the one that had a slight like we're talking instead of a one percent difference we're have or a 1.4 percent difference we have a 1.6 percent difference so they're actually very close to each other and i'm going to be working with these numbers more and creating kind of a blog post to really dive into what all the findings are but yeah thanks for asking about the data <laughs> uh, let's see oh here's the ideals and then yeah Connex 3 was the closest to the ideal, like from the CAD model versus what was actually printed. It is the closest from all the parts. I'm also, you know, using a Pittsburgh, uh, you know, Harbor Freight digital cal caliper. So there's some probably degree of error in that as well. Yes. Any other questions, Chris? I am looking through the list. Uh, let's see. Oh, somebody was asking where you can obtain the foam and ideas on the surface finish. So those are a couple. Those are the last two questions I see there, Keith. Okay, ideas on the surface. Uh, for the ideas on the surface finish, can you elaborate? I have a bunch of ideas. Um, too many. Uh, to count. Maybe it's <laughs> but, the idea on the surface finish. If you have any idea about what the surface finish is. It's a little bit of a vague question, so I don't think I can help too much, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. But yeah, so with the foam, um, I know the main office in Buffalo Grove for CTI is using, I want to say, Piedmont Plastics um, to get their foam. But uh, the the AE that actually orders it, his name is Rick Busink, so uh, I can definitely poke him uh, later. And then we can attach that to, uh, you know, the presentation. But yeah, we we buy it by the uh, four foot by eight foot sheets, and then we cut it down using a what's it called just a regular circular saw. And then if we need a part that is too big, we overcut the size, and then we use the CNC to actually cut the the foam to the specific size. And then we go in and start building our jigs out of it. So it's kind of a two-part process, but that does help us, you know, bring down the cost of our foam. And then ideas on the surface finish. Having had to finish up a lot of the uh, other prints by hand and with a, a varying amount of uh, sandpapers, which actually, I don't know if that's on the uh, final slide. One second. Oh, there you go. Da, 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 da. Oh, oh, yeah, October 1st. Okay, yeah, so later on in October, I'll have to double check when my next uh, webinar is, but I'm going into like post processing application, like advanced ones, with going through different amounts or using different methods and uh, either from ABS vapor bath for ABS, but then also going into the sandpaper polishing for Polyjet, which a long story short, it starts off at like 180, moves up into the 220s, then goes into the 320 or 280s, then 320, and then from there you go into the the 320, 400, 500, and then 600, and that helps you polish it. And then you kind of, depending on how tough and what's matter of the part, you kind of dance in between those steps of you sand. You rinse off, you dry, you polish again with the uh, higher level grits, and you keep doing that until it looks pristine. And then you, depending on your application, you can spray it with a crystal clear uh, matte coat or a crystal clear glossy coat. And if you do the glossy coat, it looks glossy, just like a you know 
a regular uh, glossy print off of a polyjet. But if you do the matte print, it looks closer to a, uh, I don't know, a sad FDM print. It's not quite as vivid, which depending on what you're going for is good and bad. So I think I touched on those two. Any other questions or refinements on questions that were submitted? I don't see any. You already covered about the uh, the polyjet material machine, so it's like we had a little bit of an internet connection issue. Thankfully, the entire webcast with the questions and answers is recorded and will be posted to the CATI YouTube channel. Well, I, I don't see any other uh, questions popping up, so um, I think we'll we'll wrap everything up, Keith. All right. Well, thank you. Yeah, and um, feel free to contact CATI if you have any other questions about uh, rolling CNCs and jigs and fixtures with additive manufacturing.